Uh, I'm Tim Kalshaw. He's Joe Hoyt. We're going to talk March Madness here. We're briefly touching on the 1984 <laughs> Final Four because I said that was my first, and that's when I covered SMU. Joe covers the Mustangs now. Actually, SMU almost beat Georgetown in that tournament wow. in the second round, and that was a, a kind of a famous game. But uh, there's a lot to get to with the different brackets. A lot of teams from Texas. Uh, two teams, prominent teams from Texas that did not get in. So maybe we should discuss those first. And in particular, uh, you can talk about the Mustangs who, from my perspective, and, and you, you would have this better, they've been on the bubble for much of the season or about a month. How, how have you viewed them and how it finally came down to the end to them not, not quite making the tournament? Yeah, it was kind of an ebb and flow thing. I mean, for about a month and a half, um, you know, I was talking with ESPN's Joe Lenardi and he kind of said they've been on the permanent bubble. And I thought that that was a good way to say because they were either doing enough to stay on it or not doing enough to get off it in the positive direction. Right. And that was, that was a tough month for them. You know, they had the quote unquote game seven mentality every single game, you know, it, it led to some good wins, but you know, when the conference tournament started, it was kind of in everyone's mind, you got to get not only one win, but two. And that obviously included beating Memphis, which ended up being an NCAA tournament team, a very talented one at that. And that's, you know, the Mustangs, I think when they lost, you know, you could kind of feel it that, okay, you know, knowing the strength of schedule concerns that the committee had with them and has always had with the American and kind of knowing that they didn't really have a, you know, dominant out of conference win that 23 and eight just might not do it. And ultimately it didn't. And uh, now I'm trying to remember Memphis, you know, of course, coached by Penny Hardaway. They, they, I guess they played them three times, right? Mm -hmm, uh, yeah. So didn't they beat them pretty easily, handily the second time they played them? Yeah, so that was so that was SMU's two biggest wins of the season, um, yeah. and then Houston as well. Um, but the one at SMU, I mean, it was a – I forgot the exact score, but it, it was a dominant display by the Mustangs. Um, Kendrick Davis uh, had an ankle injury before. I don't think Memphis expected him to play. And then on right. a hobbled ankle, he had 27 to lead them to a big win. And they out-rebounded Memphis. It was, a, it was a pretty intense uh, and a big win for them. And obviously, it's hard to beat a team three times, especially one that talented. It's unfortunate that they're, they're, they're a number one seed in the NIT now. Um, and then there was Texas A&M and I was up in Kansas city covering the big 12, but they were playing games that I could pretty much see. And they, they didn't just get the Aggies didn't just get to the sec championship. They crushed Auburn. And then they kind of did the same to Arkansas. Neither one of those games were that competitive. And so that's a, that's a two seed and a four seed on the final weekend that you just on a neutral court outplay. So a lot of people assume the Aggies were in, they played Tennessee yesterday. You know, it's their fourth game in four days. That's hard to do. They didn't, they didn't beat Tennessee and they didn't make it. Now there's obviously a big outcry here from the Aggie faithful that they got screwed and that they should have got in. They did have an eight game losing streak during the season. Yeah. <laughs> I have to think if they had gotten an at-large bid, they would have been the only team ever with an eight-game losing streak to make it in. But, you know, if, if finishing the season is important, man, they were they were good and entertaining on the final weekend. Yeah, you know, and I think that's something that the committee, you know, I mean, obviously when they talked about AM, you know, the committee representative said that, you know, we look at the entirety of the season. But honestly, there's always the kind of the the aura of, hey, you also want to get hot at the end of the season too. And I don't think – it gets much hotter than what Texas A&M did, you know, in the right. SEC, SEC tournament. And um, I think that's why a lot of people were like, hey, you know, you're a top 45 net team. You pulled off some very notable wins in the SEC tournament, obviously against Auburn being one of them. And, you know, that ultimately wasn't enough for them, too. So what what would be? And, but you're like you said, the eight game losing streak, that's kind of hard to come back from. Yeah, no, they lost to some good teams in there, but eight games is eight games. Um, now, it was interesting yesterday, the brackets obviously came out on CBS, and in a way, you have to wait for them to get through all four regions, but as you, you tweeted about it, because you're watching from an SMU perspective, I was kind of thinking about SMU, Oklahoma, and Texas A&M, all three teams that might have gotten in, and then and none of them did, and the first time you see that, that first play-in game, I think it was Rutgers, Indiana or Rutgers, Michigan, whichever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like, I think it was Rutgers, Indiana. Uh, but Rutgers, it, Notre, Notre Dame. Rutgers, Notre Dame. 
And and so you see that, and you see Notre Dame as a playing team, and you know I know where they were ranked and what their record was, and right away you're kind of thinking maybe all these teams are a little bit of trouble. Yeah, no, it was once the playing team started because I think if SB was going to get any spot, it was going to be a playing game. Same with A and M. And once you kind of knock two of those out immediately, you start looking at the rest of the board and you're like, mm, you know, it's not, it's not looking promising for those teams. Um, you know, and I, I figured at least one of them would get the other playing, one of the other two playing spots on the on that 12 seed, um, either A&M or SMU um, or Oklahoma, who also had an impressive, you know, run at the end of the, the Big 12, which is a, a conference the committee obviously likes a lot. Not as much as they like the Big 10, of course. Um, yeah. yeah. But uh but, you know, that was it, – it, it's, it's one of those things where it's kind of like a slow death kind of thing, you know, you know, death by a million cuts when you're watching. And if you're an SMU fan or an SMU player who are obviously devastated and you start seeing the writing on the wall and it just becomes more apparent and more apparent with every bracket release. It, it is really funny. And, and there's been a lot of talk through the years ever since these conference tournaments became a thing. Does the committee even watch them? <laughs> do they – do they – but I mean, they seem to put such little stock in them and they'll go back to a December non-conference game. And I think we all feel like when, if you watch a team a lot, those games just, I mean, you want to win them all, but those games are not as important as conference games late in the year. And so I'm at the big 12 in Kansas city, Oklahoma beats Baylor, which is a number one seed. They lose to tech by a point and had the ball in their hands and kind of a shaky play at the end could have been a, a foul could have even gotten to the line they don't make it iowa state goes there loses the tech by 31 and they're, <laughs> they're an 11 seed they're, and they're and neither one about a good conference record and so sometimes you're just wondering about these these conference tournament games like man i just i, I don't know if they're paying that much attention yeah, because, I mean, imagine when Oklahoma and Texas A&M were, were probably wrote off by the committee. I mean, it was probably yeah. a long time ago. And, you know, and right. then you, you start budgeting for how many teams are actually going to get in on an at-large basis. And when it comes down to it, there's just not much space left for teams that had success in conference tournaments. So, I, it, to your point, I don't think it does matter right now. And, and yeah. I think that the bracket kind of showed it. Let's talk about the guys that are in. Let's talk about the one seeds. It's Arizona, Gonzaga. Uh, Kansas and Baylor, a little bit of a surprise. The Big 12 got two, but I think once Kentucky lost to uh, Tennessee on on Saturday, that gave Baylor a great opportunity. It's kind of interesting when you look at the brackets, and I just I had to fill one out quickly for this morning news contest, which people can try to beat me. They're not going to. They, you, know, you can try to finish with a better score. Um, no, I think most of you probably will, but I know what I filled out. And then I read Jay Billis's from ESPN and I know what he filled out. And then I looked at one other and all three have Arizona and Kansas, those one seeds getting to the final four. And none of them had, had, uh, had Baylor or, um, or even Gonzaga getting there. Now, a lot mm -hmm. of people are going to pick Gonzaga. I know, but, uh, that I had, uh, Gonzaga has Texas Tech is in the West, and the two seed in the West is Duke. 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 So a lot of people are going to pick Duke. Um, some will pick Texas Tech, and and I'll just say this about Texas Tech: I haven't seen them play three games in in Kansas City. Uh, they can definitely look like a Final Four team. They are great defensively. Everybody on their team looks like they're at least six six. Um, and they can just shut you down. They also can shut themselves down. And as they did against um, Oklahoma, they went over seven minutes without a point. And then in their last game of the regular season, they went over nine minutes without a point against Oklahoma State. So they're kind of all over the map. But I think that is one of the remarkable jobs that Coach Mark Adams has done. They lose Chris Beard. People know all about the uproar about that and how Tech fans – feel about that and here's a guy who hasn't really had a he coached pan american like ages ago he's, mm -hmm. he's in his 60s he he's kind of just thrust in and that team i'm telling you they can they can definitely get to the sweet 16 but it won't surprise me if they compete with or even beat duke 
uh, if, if that two, three matchup happens out West. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'll echo your point. I mean, I, I don't think anyone, when Beard left, everyone's like, Oh no, how can you improve or how could you at least sustain, you know, what he left here at Texas tech and right. ultimately yeah, in this season, I mean, they've been able to do that. I, I, I think you're right on it when you say that defensively, you know, they're, they're, could be one of the best programs in the entire field. Um, you know, Bryson Williams obviously can score too. I think that is just my big concern with tech though, is, you know, we talk about getting hot at the right time and obviously defensive, if you're bad at defense, you're going to be bad at defense and offense can be yeah. kind of a hit or miss thing, but how sustainable is a team that relies on defense and has to be on point offensively to avoid these kind of stretches where they don't score and, and how sustainable that is that in the tournament. I, you know, I, I think I have them going all the way to either the Elite Eight or the, I have them going to the Elite Eight and losing to Gonzaga, which is kind of a chalk right. <laughs> projection yeah. there. Um, but I, I, that's my big question with them is can you, you could do it two games, you know, maybe three, but four or five, you know, can you make it back? I, I don't know if it's sustainable ultimately. You know, they played in the championship game. They don't really have a true point guard. Kansas has about three of them <laughs> and they just use them interchangeably. <clears throat> and you watch how Kansas runs its offense. And Tech just tries to, when they're not, when they're not coming off a fast break or shutting down the other team or getting turnovers, it's hard sometimes. But I do think, uh, I do think all these teams in that conference, you know, you kind of beat up on each other over a period of time, and you, you look forward to playing somebody else. Baylor's the defending national champs. Um, I saw them beat Kansas in Waco. I saw them this past week lose to Oklahoma. And it wasn't like they weren't interested. I mean, James, their point guard, James Akinjo, was flying, and he was playing well. Adam Flagler didn't play well. But, you know, I, I think they wanted to win. I, I know people kind of debate whether teams need – really good teams need to do that. And, obviously, they got a one seed anyway. But they only have seven players left. That's all that plays for them. And even though you don't have to play it back-to-back days, I have trouble picking Baylor – to get through uh, uh, the East to get to the final four, because uh, I just, I just think they're just a little short on, unless LJ Cryer, he was our leading scorer for a while and he's been out for a while. <clears throat> they don't, I, they don't seem to talk about him much. Doesn't sound like he'll play. They lost their best big man. Of course uh, they had great talent, but I have trouble seeing them get to the final four. No, I'm with you on that too. And and kind of on the crier note, it's, it's, you know, it's possible, right? I mean, and, and even, even we'll talk about it, I'm sure later, but even Marcus Sasser at Houston saying I might come back, you know, anything's possible when it comes to, right. to, to those guys. But I think, I mean, when you have seven, eight deep on a team, I mean, and that's already been dealing with injuries, you know, again, it's another question of sustainability. And, and, you know, I, I think the one C there is just more of a sign of what they could be and what were, what they were at certain points of the season. I have them ultimately losing to UCLA, um, who is a four seed in that, in that bracket. And, you know, UCLA is another team that brings back some players from, from, a, from a talented run they had last year. Johnny Juzang is one of, you know, was one of the best players in the tournament last year and, you know, shoots, you know, I think mid thirties at six foot seven, obviously has that kind of length. Um, you know, Baylor, I mean, but Scott Drew's a great coach. You know, you just, you never know. I, I just think when, it comes to the tournament and everyone is selling out 110% every single game being seven to eight deep on your, on your depth is concerning. Um, and, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Yeah. Um, now the other teams, uh, you mentioned UCLA, the PAC 12 has Arizona as a number one UCLA as a four. I think that's kind of a tough break for Baylor. I mean, I think they got the one seed, but I think they got some tough, Teams the two, you know, you don't even worry about the two and three. You probably got to beat the four first, unless something happens to US UCLA. And I'm with you on them, them being difficult. I thought USC, which went to the, let's see, they went to the Elite Eight last year. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it was weird. They had all those Pac-12 teams. Oregon State made the Sweet 16. USC UCLA went to the Final Four. USC went to the Elite Eight. And I thought USC, when they, uh, I think it was when they beat UCLA a couple weeks ago and they, and they beat Oregon and Oregon. I thought they were getting pretty good. And then they just got crushed by Arizona. And then UCLA beat them pretty, pretty handily. Um, I guess it was Friday night over the weekend. I'm trying to look at those teams in the five, six, and seven 
and see if I could project any of those teams to get to the final four. I thought USC was going to be one of those teams. They're all the way down as a seven. And the guys on ESPN don't seem to even think they could win their first round game against Miami. Yeah. Picking, picking Miami. So I'm not sure USC is a good dark horse for me. Uh, do you have any particular dark horse beyond, you know, one and two, three seeds that you think could get to the final four? I, I do. And the one that I'm riding kind of high with right now, and it might be just me drinking the Kool-Aid of the last week, but I, 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 I'm a big believer in Iowa. I think Iowa as a five seed could be very dangerous, but it's right. kind of funny because I think of them as being very dangerous, but I also think that they could lose in the round of 32 to a team that I think could be a Cinderella team in South Dakota state who has the longest winning streak in D one. And, and, yeah. I, and when it comes to March Madness, I don't know how you think about this, Tim, but I always try to find teams that are great three point shooters and like to shoot the ball. Cause you just, I think it's just, you know, I mean, I think that's a wild card that can, that can go off. I mean, think of Steph Curry, you know, that's one guy, obviously, but teams who are not, you know, from power five conferences who can shoot end up kind of or have that kind of X factor end up going on long run. So I think Iowa, if they can get past 13 seed South Dakota State, I think that's a team that could give Kansas a lot of trouble. Um, mm -hmm. For fun, I put Iowa in the Iowa State playing the Elite Eight just because I kind of want to see it because um, the state <laughs> of Iowa might just go nuts. Um but uh, that's kind of that's one dark horse I'm thinking of with Iowa. Um, I also have um, I have Arkansas getting, you know, that could give Gonzaga some trouble. I have Houston, um, who I've seen now multiple times. I've seen them about four or five times. Um, you know, obviously, they have the pedigree from last season. They lose Marcus Sasser, who's not ruling out coming back, which is kind of incredible. Right. Um, and then they have a dominant big man in Josh Carlton, which is kind of a flip side strategy for Kelvin Sampson. I mean, usually so guard heavy and, you know, and they do have Kyler Edwards still, who's, who's a pretty, you know, former Texas tech guy who can score, but it's funny that they're going to be more front court heavy and we'll see how that goes. But those are, I kind of rambled there for a little bit. Those are some dark horse teams I'm kind of thinking of. It's okay to ramble here. Everybody has a former something in this age, everybody has former and you're always surprised to hear like Texas tech has a guy who made a run with Oral Roberts last year now he's banner a, yeah heck, they're just there and that's what makes it hard when you look at a team and they finish the season you used to go well you know they're playing two freshmen and two sophomores and a junior you know they're gonna be good next year hey three of those guys might leave you don't yeah. know you don't know i mean it used to be the occasional great player turns pro now a whole bunch of them could be in the transfer portal that's how tech built their entire team that's how chris beard builds all of his teams um, that's how I saw New Year football got back on the map with, with the Sunny Dykes. Yeah. Uh, so the transfer portal has really changed kind of like you look at these teams and say, well, this guy made a run with this team last year. I was going to say, you mentioned Arkansas and obviously they're good. They've beaten the best teams in the SEC, uh, when they played them in, in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. I have them losing to Vermont the first round. Uh, <laughs> just, Vermont is a team that. I think they won 28 games. They won all their conference games, tournament games by 30. They, they're just way over that competition. They were in the tournament before. Now, they probably won't beat Arkansas, but you know there's always – there's usually 113 or 112, maybe a couple 12s, that slip through. And you can really screw things up by trying to project it. But, uh, but Vermont, I thought, was worth a shot. And, and 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 we'll see how that goes. The uh, the catamounts um, always always dangerous. The catamounts, um, but no, I'm with you that it's hard to it's hard to predict the the big upset. But it, we also know what happens. Yeah. I mean, every year. I mean, one upset I I did. I had Villan or Delaware beating Villanova 15 over a two, and honestly, it's wow. that was more of just a roll of the dice just for fun. You know, <laughs> a 15 over a two is is big. Yeah. Now we only had one 16 over a one. That was Maryland, Baltimore County over Virginia about mm -hmm. four years ago. And then Virginia won the whole thing the next year. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a lot of fun. I've been doing brackets again, apparently since before you were born, since I went to the 1984 Final Four. I know I was doing it back then. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, a thing 20 million people did back then. It was a thing hardcore college basketball fans did, but 
Uh, anyway, it's, it's a lot of fun uh, doing it. Did you have any other uh, things you wanted to hit before we get to the, the questions here? Yeah, I wanted to check with you and just see um, from a, because obviously March Madness is also about the, the, the players that emerge. It becomes very player driven, stars right. form, you know, Max Amos over at Oral Roberts last year with Kevin O'Banner. Uh, I'm just curious what player, um, you know, maybe from a Texas school, um, I'll, I'll tell you one that I'm thinking of really quick. I, you know, I covered him in high school and it's Mike Miles over at TCU, obviously a Lancaster oh, okay. alum. He's from Lancaster? Yeah, Lancaster alum who they were, they were the best 5A team in Texas that year, number one. And, but then COVID canceled that's the end of that season. So they weren't able to actually go play in the state tournament. Um, probably too much information there, but Miles is a guy I think is, you know, right. is, is very talented. I mean, that's one guy. Oh, man, he's, he's lightning quick. He, he, he hit, you know, uh, that game where they came back to beat Texas. He got hurt in that game. He was carried mm-hmm. off the floor. And then he came back a few minutes uh, later and he didn't, I don't think he did much at the end. When he was gone, it was the other guy, uh, Miller, I think, who who took over. Mm-hmm. But um, but man, he he had some big shots against Texas, and you know I don't I don't have a I don't have the high school connection. I will moving forward because I went to a bunch of Richardson games this year. Yep. So when Kason Wallace is at Kentucky, or when Rylan Griffin is at Richardson, is my alma mater, and they were number one in the state number one in the country for a while didn't quite make it to the state uh, finals there uh when Ryland griffin's at alabama i'll be watching him too but yeah i mean uh you know there are some players this isn't a player timmy allen at texas is a guy i i've seen score zero (laughs) and do almost nothing and then um at times he's He's really good defensively, as most of the Texas players are. And then he just like turns into this power forward. He's hitting jumpers. And <laughs> he, he might be the most inconsistent player that they could go. You know, Texas is a six. Virginia Tech's an 11. Virginia Tech just beat Duke. It's hard for me to even think about Texas beating that team. But obviously, the way they're seated and the way they have played defense throughout the year, people think they could. I have trouble making that pick though. And then Purdue after that too. I mean, if Purdue beats, of course, you, yeah. know, you know, the, uh, and Ivy, the, for some reason, Ivy league teams always pose first round threats. I, it blows yeah. my mind, but if that's not, that's not, that's not an easy road to Texas. Not at all. Um, okay. Uh, we will, uh, uh, we were going to talk briefly about coach K just mentioned, uh, um, you know, this is his final, Final swing at it, and it's it's kind of interesting the way he lost that last game against North Carolina, and the early part wasn't even on, well, at least the sound wasn't on because Texas and Kansas went to overtime, so that was kind of a disaster. And then it looked like okay, he's going to get his coronation at the ACC tournament. They're playing what was Virginia Tech the seven seven seed? I think they were the seven seed, yeah, seven seed in the ACC, and Virginia Tech kind of controls the game and, and, and wins it. Uh, so he didn't win that either. Now he's the, he's a two seed and obviously twos can win. And it would be fun to see him. He, he came to the, the final four in 86, the last time, both the last time, well, not the last time it was in Dallas. It was in Arlington a few years ago, but the last time when it was at reunion arena, the last time the final four was held at a regular basketball venue. And, uh, uh, and that, so that was his first Final Four. So it's kind of an interesting connection to that here 36 years later, trying to hang on and, and go to another one. I didn't pick them to, but I could obviously see them see them doing that as a two seed. Yeah, and it's, it's funny. I mean, kind of what you're saying, I feel like at every stop this season, because we've, we've known he's going to retire, it's like, okay, here's that, this is going to be the moment where, you know, you celebrate it and ride off. And kind of saying the regular season finale, you know, with North Carolina – and then the conference tournaments, all right, they'll beat Virginia Tech. And it's like, well, can you ride off into the sunset in March Madness? Um, I don't think it's going to happen, um, <laughs> but we'll see. All right. We're ready to uh, take some questions here. And we're going to have a, an equipment adjustment and a move while we do that as I go plug my <laughs> in as we show you some behind the scenes things. But 
Joe can take the first question and I will uh, pitch in when I can here. Yeah, question number one, why is it called March Madness? I, I, I bet there's an origin story. I don't know, and, I, and maybe Tim knows it, but ultimately March Madness is at least colloquially known as madness because it is madness. Um, you know, we do brackets every single year. We pick teams that are, you know, this team's a rock solid you know, no matter what, pick for the Sweet 16. It's 100%. And then they lose by 20 in the first round, you know, as a two seed to a 15 seed. It happens all the time. Um, speaking of Duke, I know that they lost to CJ McCollum and uh, I can't remember their school because that's how small it is, but CJ McCollum was a 15 seed and, you know, that just throws everything into madness. So everyone watches it. It goes, every projection you have just goes to waste and, and it's, it is madness. Yeah. I think, I think of the buzzer beaters to win games uh, it, it was funny when they were closing the Irwin Center at my alma mater, the University of Texas, somebody was doing a chart or a list of the biggest basketball moments there. And one of them, somebody's number one, didn't even, it wasn't even a Texas game. It was Arkansas's U.S. Reed hitting a half court shot to win an NCAA tournament game there. And I think it's those kind of moments. And then when Robert Morris or Coppin State or Princeton, you mentioned Ivy League, uh, uh, Cornell won two games and went to the Sweet 16 uh, a few years back. Uh, those kind of things. A lot of times it's upsets that don't quite happen, but sometimes they do. And obviously the ultimate is Maryland, Baltimore County beating number one seed Virginia. That's, that's truly March Madness. So I don't remember exactly uh, when it was coined. I think people just started calling it that in the late 80s, early 90s. And and CBS kind of stole it, co-opted it, and put it on their put it on their shirts and their logo, their logos, and, and the way we went. Yeah, it's just so many stories that you could not script. And I know it's a cliche, but it, it's true. I mean, I mean, who would say Sister Jean and Loyola would go all the way? Yeah. <laughs> um, question number two: How many upsets should I pick? And this is something that we were kind of talking about earlier. I, I mean, there's going to be some every single year. You should pick some. I can't exactly predict which ones you should. I, I picked South Dakota State as a 13 seed to win. Um, I mean, I, I think a handful in the first round is probably a safe amount. What, what do you think? I, I think don't pick any 16s, 15s, or 14s to win, even though Joe has a 15. <laughs> Let's let him be alone on that. <laughs> uh, I picked a 13. I picked Vermont to beat Arkansas. Uh, there are a couple of teams – you know, once you get to six versus 11 and seven versus 10, if you look at the point spreads, those are like three and four point favorites. I mean, those, those are barely like, I have a hard time, as I said, conceiving of Texas as a favorite against the team that just won the ACC title. So once you get into those, it's okay. I used to have a, a formula and it's not like it worked more than once, but I, so I always do this. I pick, for the final four, I picked two ones to play each other. But then on the other side, neither one of the ones make it. <clears throat> so this year I had to decide, do Arizona and Kansas look like they could make it or do Gonzaga and Baylor? I can't break them up because the other <laughs> one has to be like a, a two against a four. Now it happens that way sometimes. It's not a guaranteed, <laughs> guaranteed success. But so I have, as you'll see, if you play in this contest, uh, I have Arizona, Kansas on one side, and um, uh, Texas Tech, Kentucky on the other. And now I'm picking Texas Tech, and I just said they could lose their second game. They they could get beat by a six seed because they they their offense shuts down at times. I don't think it will, but I mean I I think the overall rule is you don't pick a ton of them, but there's no reason once you, especially you get to a twelve versus five and eleven versus six. Pick a couple of those for sure. And, you know, we saw what was Connecticut when they won the final four here. They beat Kentucky. Was it, was it an eight seed? They were an eight seed that lost to SMU twice. Yeah, it had and to SMU win did, the tournament, right? The conference SMU tournament. Didn't, to get in. SMU didn't get in the tournament. They beat the national champion twice. Larry Brown wasn't happy about that. And, <laughs> and, and that wasn't a great Kentucky team. They got hot. I feel like they were a four or five. I mean, that that's unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, usually a couple ones make the final four. 
but then a two and a four or three and a five, somebody slips in Loyola, you know, Loyola started in Dallas on their mm-hmm. run three or four years ago and, and made it as a, I think an 11, 10 or 11. So. I, and then I think rarely it's, I, I, only one time I can think of where the final four is all one seed. So upsets will happen. That actually happen. didn't happen because Memphis vacated their spot. So that they, thing that we think we saw, it didn't really take place according to, <laughs> according to the NCAA. You're right. That's the only time it was in San Antonio and, and four, right, ones, yeah. four ones made it. Uh, right. Do we have more queries? Yeah. Right? We got a we got a few more. Who has been to the most Final Fours? I don't know off the top of my head. I, I can imagine some of the Blue Bloods uh, have contention for that. Do you know who has been to the most? I mean, you know, UCLA has won eleven or twelve championships because of all the wooden years. Uh, Duke has been to a lot now. Um, Indiana's hmm. been to a bunch. I've got to think it's UCLA, but yeah. I but I don't know. I don't know that for sure. But I mean. They won so many with John Wooden. Then they won after him with, uh, well, they went to a championship with Larry Brown and lost that. Mm -hmm. Then they won 20 years ago or so. So my guess is UCLA, but I don't don't have that. So I did a quick Google search because I'm just so good with my research skills. Um, (laughs) And uh, it's actually North Carolina has the most. Oh, Oh, yeah, that's all right. That makes sense because they went forever. And didn't win. It took Dean Smith a long time uh, till like uh, uh, late seventies to get that that first one, <clears throat> that first title. But but they went all the time, and they've continued to go a lot. So that makes that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Question or next question. Tell us more about your bracket and how you select the teams. You've already kind of done that, especially from a Final Four perspective. I think from my perspective, I try to find teams I really like that can go all the way to a final four and do a national championship. And then after that, I kind of try to pick chaos. Um, I am a, uh, I am a weird bracket picker. Um, as I, as I said, I put Iowa and Iowa state in the elite eight, just cause I used to work in Iowa and I, I know what that, what a Cyhawk rivalry would do to that state. And I kind of want to see it. Um, nice. Tim, you already touched a little bit on yours. Any other I touched people? a little bit on it, but I'll say this. Um, I don't, I try not to get carried away with conference tournaments. Because sometimes, and I asked Bill Self about this, and he said it's not a problem in the Big 12 because their championship game is on Saturday. But for the Big 10 and the SEC and a couple of the other conferences, if you're playing the championship on a Sunday and you potentially could play on a Thursday, you really don't want to be doing that. I mean, you're okay doing it. You're not going to tank. But there are, if you're a really good team, like – I would be like you picked Iowa and Iowa might I was hot and they might do a lot of good things. I think Purdue was really good up to a month ago and people were talking about them as this could be the best team in the country. Then they started getting, <clears throat> excuse me, they started getting beat up in their own conference. And sometimes that happens. And then you get out of conference in the tournament and you kind of get back to being what you used to. I mean, that's just a theory and it, it can happen occasionally. So I would say filling out a bracket. I don't, I don't go too like, I thought Tennessee was pretty good anyway. Mm-hmm. Now maybe them winning, it makes me think they're, they're a potential final four team, but, but somebody who sneaks through, I don't think Virginia Tech's necessarily a team I would pick to go far, even though they're playing Texas. And that's, that seems a winnable game. I, I just think you gotta, you gotta watch that sometimes when you, like had the Aggies made it, I, I wouldn't have picked them to do do anything just because they, they got hot and did that. But that's just one way to look at brackets. And, and imagine if they would have gone from playing on a Sunday on the, after the road that they've been on to, to playing a play-in game on a Tuesday. That I yeah, wouldn't that have picked them right. either. Like, they would have played Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday. Yeah. Five games in six days. That would have been perfect. Very casual, yeah. Um, is there an internal contest at the DMN, and what is the prize if your team wins? There is a – Dallas Horn News contest, and you got to go up against Tim. Um, I forget what the prize is, though. The prize, <clears throat> yes, if you go online, uh, the the main prize is Mavericks tickets. So the main prize is good. And then there's some other Amazon-related uh, prizes. You have to beat me with your bracket. And I've already told you 
<clears throat> my final four. I'm not going to tell you who I have winning it, but I do have Arizona, Kansas, Kentucky, and Texas Tech in the final four. Um, uh, there, there, there's not, an, uh, to my knowledge, not an internal one like with the writers that when we, <laughs> in the days when we had a larger staff, uh, there used to be a pool that Dave Renbarger on the desk ran. And I was in that for, for a number of years, but all the pools seem to be online now. And, and this one with the morning news is fun. So try to take advantage of that if you can. Mm -hmm. Which uh, Texas team has the toughest road? I, I think we already talked a little bit about a team like Texas, you know, who <clears throat> might not get out of the first round against a hot Virginia Tech team. Um, Houston, you know, is another team with another tough road. I, TCU, if they happen to be the tough Seton Hall team, they get the uh, the well deserved honor of playing in Arizona in round two. Um, what yeah. what uh, what some what are some teams you put tough? Well, I think Baylor, even for a one seed, their second game is against North Carolina or Marquette. We just saw North Carolina win at Duke. Uh, Marquette plays in the Big East, and they've lost a bunch of games, but they've got some good wins against the better teams in that league. And and Baylor is just so, as I said, they pretty much play seven guys. If, and in the game they played at, at Kansas City, Adam Flagler, I believe he finished with two points. If somebody's not going, uh, I think they can get in trouble quickly. Um, Texas, I mentioned that there are six, but that's got to be like a toss up against Virginia Tech. Um, Houston, you know Houston much better. They're, they're a, a five. Do they open with Alabama, Birmingham? Who do they open with? Yeah, they open with Alabama, Birmingham. Which okay, is now that's a pretty good team. Course, I've never seen Alabama, Birmingham play. They were a team, some of the people on ESPN were talking up, you know, watch out for who they play. They can shoot threes and do this and that. Now, I, I don't imagine Houston's going to go go out in the first round, but it gets, it gets tough after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also have Illinois and Chattanooga who they would play next, and Chattanooga the team that's another team that's been kind of a trendy upset team. Yeah, uh, maybe Chattanooga upsets Illinois. Maybe that helps Houston. You know, you beat a 12 and then a 13 to kind of get things going, unless you lose to a 13, mm -hmm. then it's not so good. Uh, who got snubbed this year? We already talked a lot extensively in the, <clears throat> the front part of that, but just to kind of rehash, um, yeah. you know, yeah, SMU, Texas A&M were two teams in particular, Oklahoma. Uh, Oklahoma and A&M had similar kind of situations where they went on runs late and, you know, and obviously we looked at it and the, con I mean, the conference tournament <laughs> doesn't have enough implications, it seems, from the outside. SMU was a team that was on the bubble forever. I compared them to a Game of Thrones character that you loved that just kept avoiding death and then in the last season finally found it. Um, so that, we kind of touched on that a little bit. Was there anything additional you wanted to mention about <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, no, the, the A&M thing is just interesting because, as I said, they, or we said, they lost eight straight games in February. Uh, I guess it was in February. It was in the latter half of conference. Now, they lost to, in that stretch, I remember looking at it over the weekend, Auburn, Kentucky, LSU twice. They lost to a bunch of tournament teams, and, and some of those were close games, but they lost eight in a row. And so that's got to be a team that isn't even really <clears throat> on the radar Thursday when the committee is starting to do its bracket. And then, okay, they beat Florida on a late shot. Okay, big deal. All right, now they beat Auburn, which was the number one team in the nation for about a month, and they beat them handily. And then they beat Arkansas, and they kind of crushed them too. And they have all these highlight plays by – Quentin Jackson, they look like a, a team that's on fire. It's hard for me to see how there's not a way when you have 68 teams and that many at large teams that, that a team that's hot at the end of the year doesn't make up for some of its mistakes. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, I think AM will probably be a case study for the argument of do conference tournaments actually matter? Right. What, what are we doing with these conference tournaments other than having moneymakers if, if we're not going to pay attention? To the results. I, I agree completely. Um, next question. We got two more questions. Um, talk a little bit more about UT. What happened this year? I expected more from Chris Beard, and I'm very disappointed that he blamed the players. Obviously, Tim, you're a UT alum, and you got to see a little bit of the Big 12 tournament. Do you want to start on that one? He was, uh, you know, because I asked the writers who cover the team, I said, has he talked about the players like this before? And they said, no, not all year. He After that game, he 
he talked about his quote was basically, uh, I hate to lose more than I like to win. These players don't know. They think they do, but they don't know what it takes to win. I hope they would answer your question saying they want to watch some of these players from teams that know how to win and learn how to do it. Okay. He brought all these guys in. They're all transfers from these schools that weren't winning programs like Utah. It, well, he got one from uh, somebody who did win, but uh, Arizona state is where they got their guard. Um, they had all conference players from the big 10, the PAC 12 and the Atlantic 10 come to their team, but they're all, they weren't from very good teams. And, and, <laughs> Chris Beard's job has got to be after 32 games to help teach them how to win. It's, it's odd for me to hear a coach say that in the middle of March, uh, say that in November when they're young and, or they're new. Um, as far as their team, I, I just don't have any faith in them doing anything. Their offense is very spotty. They, they, their opponents average 59 points a game. They do not, they play slow. And they, and they do not let you score easily. And they play a bunch of guys, so they're, they're aggressive on defense and they're very good defensively. They're just not very good on offense ever. And sometimes they're good enough to win. I don't I, – I, I just – you know, it makes you wonder, okay, what's year two for Chris Beard going to be like? They started five seniors <laughs> against, against TCU and lost. Mm -hmm. uh, those guys – except I think Andrew Jones can come back one more time. Uh, those guys are not going to be back. So it's going to be new transfers. And it is just, you know, I'd have to say his first year there was a failure. Yeah. I mean, can you find those winners? This is this the second time in a transfer portal? And anytime a coach kind of makes that plea or, you know, speaks through the media at the very end of the season saying, you know, in an effort, it's seemingly to try and motivate his players before March Madness, it kind of screams of desperation to me and it seems like a yeah. last ditch effort and um i don't know if that's enough time to turn it around and figure out how to win on their own but you know i guess we'll see <clears throat> they, they they've, they've got like a week off between losing to tcu and i think they play friday afternoon so mm -hmm. whatever he can teach them in a week would be valuable because they're playing a team that knows how to win they just beat duke in the yeah. acc championship yeah the team that wants to win too um last question thoughts on duke making a run speaking of which um we touched on that already a little bit too. I mean, one of those things that, I mean, if we talk about March Madness storytelling, Mike Krzyzewski's last run and seeing that go all the way to a final four would obviously be a nice way to close that. Um, I don't, I personally don't see it happening. I think Texas Tech's going to give them a lot of problems if that's who they end up matching up with. Um, you know, is that, what do you, what do you think, Tim? <clears throat> I, I think about that game. Here's what I think. And I think about all the times that basketball fans think Duke has gotten the calls to help them win games, to keep advancing. And I'm thinking, okay, it's CBS. It's next Thursday or Friday night out in uh, San Francisco. Duke's playing Texas Tech. Which team does CBS want to win that game? Uh, it's pretty obvious. Now, I'm not suggesting it's truly a conspiracy, but anytime there's a call that goes against Tech, people will go nuts in that game. I don't – I, you know, I'll say this, and I and I could be way wrong. I, I'm not as sold on Gonzaga as everybody else. They have one tough team, one really tough team in their conference, and, and they got beat badly at St. Mary's. And when they played them again in the championship game on a neutral site, it took them a while to to put them away. So I, I just they're they're very good, but I don't I don't think just because they they're a high scoring team playing out there and they beat teams on their home floor like Texas uh, and other good teams. They beat UCLA. I know that. That, that that win was impressive. I just, I'm not sold that they're unbeatable. So I guess I'm saying if Duke gets by Texas Tech, which I don't have happening, I could see them beating Gonzaga and, uh, and making one more run to the final four, which it would be when it comes to, you know, storytelling and all that would be terrific for college basketball. Yeah, and I tend to wonder sometimes, you know, and we, we see it sometimes with the opposite of things. The opposite of things. I think Michigan's played well since they lost their, you know, coach to suspension. Still, I mean, because their coach slapped the coach from, from Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, LSU. I mean, we'll see what LSU does in response to now having an interim after Will Wade got fired. I, 
I think sometimes players respond to to these moments in different ways, and obviously they're different moments. But I wonder if there is any fuel that comes with, hey, this yeah. is my Chelsea's last run, or if you put, end up putting too much pressure on yourself. That right. Way. We'll, we'll see. Um, I think that so anyway, we have no more questions. Is there any final thoughts, Tim, uh, on the tournament? Um, no, just get those brackets in. Uh, sorry to SMU, sorry to AM, sorry to the Sooners, but it's going to be a fun tournament. Uh, a lot of Texas teams left. One of the Texas teams tomorrow night will advance Texas Southern or Texas Corpus Christi, mm-hmm. and we'll see how they do. That probably won't last long, but. I mean, I think it, uh, you know, it, I think with the way things have changed with transfers, it's just, it gets harder than ever to, to pick because you, you think about guy, teams that have been good in the past and now these players are jumping around. It just kind of turns into a scramble, but I guess that's the new definition of March Madness. Mm-hmm. And with that being said, there will probably be a lot of upsets because we don't know I mean, everyone doesn't know who's on each other's team. So right. uh, it's going to be a good tournament, a lot of madness, that's guaranteed. Um, and uh, try to beat Tim in your brackets, everyone. But uh, thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, thanks for subscribing. Thank you, everybody. Take care.